Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can keep using sequential IDs in your database to benefit from that very nice indexing performance without having to worry about those IDs being guessable and potentially compromising your application security. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe or ring the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. And before I move on, I just want to take a minute to thank you all so much for 100,000 subscribers. I could have never imagined that I would reach that milestone three years ago when I started this YouTube channel sharing my knowledge with all of you. Now, to celebrate this insane achievement, I want to give the first 200 of you a 20% discount if you use discount code 100k on my website nickchapsters.com and this will work across all of my courses and bundles. So if you are waiting for a discount to get started now, this is your chance. Again, thank you very much for 100,000 subscribers and see you hopefully in 1 million. So let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve here. and let's say I have a simple uh, API and that API has a users controller and I'm storing users somewhere in my backend. Now, if I run this API um, without showing you the code internally, I can go to Postman and I can access users using IDs, sequential IDs as unique identifiers. So if I say zero, for example, the user does not exist, so I'm getting a not found. If I use one, however, the user does exist and I can read me. Now, the problem is that someone using that endpoint might think, hmm, that's one. What if I do two? Oh, I'm getting someone else. And what if I do three and it goes on? And fun fact, a while back, I was given a link to track one of my orders. I can't remember which supplier it was from, but I saw in the URL that was using an integer as an ID. And what I did, because I'm me, is I tried to change the ID to increment and decrease the number. And what I found was it would actually give me exactly the location of where this delivery is going and the name of where it was being delivered to. So huge security vulnerability there just because of sequential IDs. Now, the reason why you might want to use them is it can greatly benefit the performance of your application on the database level because you can index in a very nice way if you use sequential IDs as primary keys. However, you should not under any circumstance expose them to your API layer or any other customer facing layer because it can really be a vector for attack. So how can we solve that problem? Well, historically, people tend to move towards GUIDs. So instead of storing the actual sequential ID, you would generate a GUID and then you would call that endpoint using a GUID. And if I go back into that service, you can actually see that I have the same entries, but with GUIDs or globally unique identifiers, which can kind of guarantee based on its pseudo randomness that I can just keep generating them and they won't clash with each other. And also I don't need to check my database that this thing exists before I insert it because the chances of having a clash are the lifetime of the universe big. So you don't really have to worry about it. Now, the problem with GUIDs is that first they're long, they're 16 bytes long in their GUID form, but in the string form, they can be longer. So people actually to optimize for URLs and things like that, and even storage, they remove hyphens and they even try to convert them from that form to a base 32 maybe, and even then trim some of it. So people really try to optimize for that type of problem. And then even if you use them, you lose the benefit on the database layer. So how can we have the best of both worlds? How can we have sequential IDs on the RDBMS level, but also a non-guessable random looking ID on the API or customer facing layer? Well, this is where a library called hash IDs comes into picture. And there are many libraries that can do that, but this one has a lot of features that I like and it's simple enough for me to recommend. Now, side note, like with any video of me taking a look at any open source library, I highly encourage you to open that description and click that link and give it a star on GitHub because it can really, really boost the morale of those developers behind those projects. So if you want to support the community and the creator because you think that what you see is cool, please go ahead and give a star on GitHub. Now, let's see how it works. And I'm going to start from the API layer before I deconstruct and go back to the nitty gritty, because I want to show you straight away how it can add value to your business use case. Now, the problem we're trying to solve is we do not want to have sequential IDs on the API layer. And how can we solve that? I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this endpoint and I'm going to change that to a hash ID. Side note, this hash ID is not a cryptographic hash. The reason why it's called like that is because people referred to these hash looking IDs, hash hash IDs, and the creators just chose that name because it is what people know them as. Like right now, if you're on a web browser, you can go to the URL and you'll see an 11 character long 
ID hash looking thing. This is the same thing we're trying to recreate a URL friendly random looking hash type of thing. That's why it's called the hash. And actually Instagram does that. Many applications do that. So we're going to give that experience exactly as YouTube does. And I'm going to go ahead and remove the int constraint and change that to a string. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and add hash ids.net, the NuGet package in this project. So I'm going to go ahead and install it. It's here. And I'm going to go and inject a private read only I hash IDs and inject that from the constructor. And then I'm going to go to my endpoint and I'm going to say var raw ID because I'm accepting a string, which is that hash ID. And I want to convert it back to the true raw ID, which I'm using in the database. So I'm going to say hash IDs dot decode. And it has other methods to decode hex if you're using a hex or decode long if you're using a long and also the equivalent encode methods. So I'm going to say decode here and pass down the ID which represents the hash. And I'm going to say if raw ID dot length equals zero, then return not found. And the reason why I'm checking for the length is because decode methods return a, an int or a long array. And we're going to see how this works when we take a look at it in isolation layer. And now that we have the raw ID, I can actually change that here and get the first item in that array, which is the ID in its raw form. And that's everything I need on my API layer. Now what's left is in the program.cs, I obviously need to register that interface. So I'm going to say builder.services.add singleton i hash IDs, and I'm going to create a new hash IDs object. And this object has a few things I want to customize. First, the most important one, the salt. It's called a salt. It's kind of like a seed, basically. So you pass a string in here. And the idea of this string is as long as your hash ID objects are instantiated with this salt, then any encoding and decoding will use that to be deterministic. So the number one using that salt will always give you the same encoded string and will be used to decode it too. We're going to see how that works in a second. You can also pass down the minimum length that you want because by default, this is trying to be efficient and it's trying to create strings that are small enough to contain what you're trying to do. But if I do the YouTube thing, which is 11 characters, then I can specify that the minimum length of my hash will be 11. I can also specify a custom alphabet, but by default, it's using uppercase, lowercase and numbers in the English alphabet. And I can also have separators, which are used to prevent curse words for ending up in those hash IDs. So we won't customize any of that. I'm just going to delete it. But this is all the setup we need to do. And now all I'm going to do is go back to the hash IDs and do debug hash IDs API. And I'm going to go back to the API. And instead of using the int endpoint, I'm going to use the hash IDs endpoint. And this weird looking like YouTube URL looking string is my hash ID. This translates to one. So I think it's one. It might be two. I think it's one. So if I use it, and actually this should be hash ID, not hash ID is my mistake. So if I now run it, you can see, yeah, it's two. So Nicolas Cage is the second one with ID two, but that ID was passed by that hash ID. And actually I have the other hash ID here. So let me just grab it. So back here, if I delete that and paste this, this represents one. You can see there's no correlation between the two things. They look completely different and unguessable. And this is also case sensitive. So if I had capital case D, for example, I'm getting me back. But if I do lowercase D, I'm not getting me back. So case sensitivity matters, meaning you have double the characters for each character of the English language, which is great. So let me just quickly stick a breakpoint here and show you how this works. I'm going to go ahead and press execute. And as you can see, ID comes in. It just looks like a hash ID, a string. And I'm going to go ahead and decode it. And this decoding returns an array. And the reason why it returns an array is actually because you can encode multiple individual values to a single string ID. So if you have that use case where you might want two IDs in a single string hash looking thing, you can do that here. And then I'm checking the length, obviously. And all I do is I get the first ID, which is the ID I encoded, and it just works. So great, great at solving the problem we have. Now let's go to a console app and see all that in more detail. So I'm going to close that, expand this, and I'm going to delete that. And all I need to do first is add the hash ID NuGet package. So here we go. And fundamentally, all you need is a hash IDs package. You can use just the raw implementation. So hash 
IDs here or the interface. And like I said, you need a salt. This is super, super important. You want that to be long and unguessable because anyone that can guess your hash ID salt will actually be able to decode the strings and encode them and potentially find the security vulnerability in your system. So maybe a long GUID as your salt that is consistent will be good. And you don't need to customize anything else. I'm going to leave it as it is. And then I'm going to say first ID equals hash IDs dot encode. I'm going to encode one and then second IDs will be hash IDs dot encode two and three. So two integers in the same hash ID. So I'm going to say console dot right line and I'm going to do first ID and then console right line second IDs. So if I go ahead and I run this, as you can see, it just returns these two strings. This is one and this is two and three in a single string. And it's very easy to get the values back. So first I can say first raw ID equals hash IDs dot decode. And I don't have the text, but I can just grab it from here. So if it's incoming, you can decode that. And then second row IDs equals hash IDs dot decode. And it has all that logic built in to know how to decode two of them. So I can do that. And then I'm going to say console.read just to block the application from exiting. So we're going to stick a breakpoint and debug this. And let's go down. So here you go. As you can see, as long as we use the same salt, the values are the same. So I'm printing them and then I can decode them. As you can see here, the value here is one and here the value is two and three exactly what we put in and just to show you the salt thing if i go ahead and i change nick to something else uh, and i run it again then as you can see not only am i getting completely different looking ids hash ids for the same things um, but also i cannot really decode these two which were encoded with a previous salt because they just don't know how to handle them the salt is part of the equation it's what makes this unguessable so make sure it's a big random thing that can't be guessed and shouldn't be changed. At this point, I should mention that this really only applies if you do sequential IDs for your database and the database is an RDBMS. For things like Cosmos DB, DynamoDB and those NoSQL databases, sharding happens in a different way. So GUIDs as IDs is totally fine. It actually is a good idea because it will randomize and split the partitions effectively. So it doesn't really apply here. Maybe if you're interested in that, I can do a video on how you can optimize GUIDs as IDs for memory too, because there's many ways you can do that. So if you want to see that, leave a comment down below. But this mostly applies to RDBMSs when you don't want to expose your sequential IDs to the end user. Now, you know me, I cannot wrap up a video without talking about performance. And many of you might be wondering, okay, Nick, how is this going to affect my application's performance? Now, think about it. You're probably going to have two of these on each call, one incoming and one outgoing to convert it from the raw integer to the hash ID because you won't really store this ID. There's no value in storing it. I think it's better to compute it than store it. Plus, if you want to change your salt for some reason in the future, you won't have to re-index and update all the entries you have in the database. So I wouldn't store this. But let's see how performance is affected by adding something like this. So I just brought in this hash benchmark C sharp class. And originally I was trying to compare the hash IDs approach int from hash and hash from mint to GUID to string and string to GUID. However, that's just not a comparable use case. So I scrapped that. And what I did instead is I'm just going to look at this in isolation and give you my opinion on it and some advice. So this is what the benchmark is looking like. We don't even need this GUID, to be honest. And we're going to convert to an integer from a hash and to a hash from an integer. That's it. So I'm going to go back to the program.cs, comment all that beauty out, and then say benchmark runner dot run hash benchmark. Here we go change that to release mode and run that benchmark. So let's give it a second. Let's see what we get. So results are back and let's see what we have. So as you can see, interesting results. The int from hash conversion takes 833 nanoseconds with half a kilobyte of memory. And the hash from int is half a microsecond with 300 bytes of memory. So it is not bad at all. Those are nanoseconds. So one nanosecond is one thousandth of a microsecond, which is one thousandth of a millisecond. So you have plenty of space there. Now, admittedly, the memory is not great. However, this package is actually not really optimized for the latest and greatest that .NET has to offer, especially around read-only spans and memory optimizations there. So if any of you want a nice task, a nice project to contribute to, I highly recommend you check the project out and maybe you make a PR to optimize for memory and performance because 
there's a lot of room to optimize this. And actually, I think the easiest way we can optimize too is because this by default actually returns an array of integers or longs or whatever you choose to go with. Um, this is actually a bit of a performance issue because how often do you need to work with uh, the array itself? You probably want just the one value. And in the case where something was an array, you want to be explicit about it. So if we had an overload that returns an integer directly, a value type, we would save memory there. And if we had better processing of the string, both here and internally, this can actually be way faster and allocate little memory, very little memory. So if you're looking for a nice optimization task in C Sharp, this is a great opportunity. In any case, I do not think that the performance we get right now from this is prohibitive. The value proposition of the project far outweighs its memory and performance. Again, we're talking nanoseconds and bytes. So it's fine, but if you really, really care about these optimizations, there's a lot of room to optimize. So I highly recommend you give it a go and a star. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.